solve our LBO modeling case study here. This time, we're going to focus on what I call LBO valuation. And remember, in the case study questions we looked at in part one of this, a big focus was answering questions such as how much a private equity firm could pay for a company to achieve a certain cash on cash multiple. We also had some questions about what the IRR would be at that multiple. And then we had some questions about how you could change the other parameters to achieve certain cash on cash or money on money multiples and certain IRRs as well. So this entire process of taking the simple LBO model that we had in the first part of this case study and then using it to actually value a company and to assess how much a PE firm could pay for it is what we call LBO valuation. Now, before we jump into the Excel part and answering all the case study questions, I want to point out a few quick things about how this process works so that you approach it the right way. As I said, the goal here is to figure out what a private equity firm could pay for a company in a leveraged buyout if it is targeting a specific IRR or a specific cash on cash multiple, and if you have the financial projections for the company. Now, we get a lot of confused questions about how exactly LBO valuation works and how to set it up. And in a lot of cases, people don't understand this important fact that you have to be targeting a specific return or a specific returns multiple. If you don't have that, this whole concept makes no sense at all. This is not like a DCF or public comps or president transactions where you can just look at the company and based on its financial characteristics, come up with an appropriate multiple or an appropriate share price. You need to be targeting a specific return in this case. In a lot of cases, this will set the floor for the valuation of the company because oftentimes this will produce numbers that are lower than what you would get from say a discounted cash flow analysis or comparable public companies or precedent transactions or assuming a premium over the company's current share price if it's a public company. I say right here, not always, because in our view, it's not correct that this is always what happens. You will have cases where sometimes the other methodologies actually come up with lower numbers. It really depends on the company and the industry and what's been going on in the market. So in a lot of interview guides and resources, they'll say that the LBO valuation always gives the lowest value. In our view, it's not correct, and it's certainly not universally correct to say that. To figure this out, you're going to use the goal seek function in Excel, and you'll see a couple examples coming up of how to do that. Now, there are also a couple requirements here. First off, you have to reduce the purchase price or the purchase multiple to a single cell. So going up here, into our Excel model, we're fine because this purchase multiple isn't is a single cell. If this were a public company, we would be assuming a premium to the company's share price. Both of those are fine. What's not fine is if you have some type of combo method where let's say that the purchase price is based on turns of EBITDA. And so you have one X term loan, one X term loan B, and then you go down and you have a multiple of EBITDA for each of them and a multiple for investor equity, and you add all those up and that's how you get to the purchase price, that would not be fine because then you cannot reduce it to a single cell. And the way the goal seek function in Excel works, you set a cell to a specific value by changing another specific cell. So it is problematic if it is not set up the way we have it here. Now, another requirement is that you cannot have circular references. So you have to disable these if you're doing this type of valuation. Going back to our Excel model again, notice here how our M&A fees and our sponsor fees are both based on the purchase enterprise value, which is a little bit non-standard. The M&A fees should probably not be based on that actually. The sponsor fees should probably be tied to investor equity instead. But we're not doing that here because if we do that, it's going to create circular references. Similarly, if you go down and you look at the interest expense here, we're always calculating it based on the beginning balance. So in other words, the balance from the prior year, year zero, when we're in year one. And we're doing that very intentionally because if we use the average balance here, 
we would end up with circular references and the whole goal seek function would not work correctly. So that's another requirement. And for the exit, you should always have the IRR or the cash on cash multiple in a single cell that stays the same regardless of the exit year. So here, for example, if we built in the functionality to allow for exits in different years, such as year four, five, six, seven, eight, or years one and two even, we'd still want to calculate these numbers, the multiple and the IRR, both in the same cell that always stays the same regardless of the year that we sell the company. If you don't do it this way, you're going to get a lot of issues when you go in and you try to change around the exit year. So those are a few things to watch out for. You can also apply the same method with goal seek to figure out, for example, if a company needs to hit certain financial milestones to achieve a certain IRR or a certain multiple. So you might be able to say, the company has to have margins of 28.5% and the purchase price has to be below 6.5x EBITDA and then we can achieve a 25% IRR. So these are some of the other questions that you can answer by using the goal seek function like this in Excel. With that said, let's jump in and actually apply the goal seek function now. Now, remember the first question here is how much could a private equity firm pay for the company to achieve a 2.5x cash on cash multiple over a three year period? Since we have our model set up, you can just go to the cash on cash multiple cell, press Alt A, W, G, and then we want to set cell F89, which is exactly what our cash on cash multiple cell is here, to 2.5x. Notice how I'm not including the X, it's just 2.5. And then we want to do that by changing cell 8x, so the purchase multiple cell F7 up here. So let's enter all those parameters and press OK. And we have a solution. So we get to a purchase multiple of 7.4x, purchase enterprise value of 372 million euros. And based on that, we can actually now answer our first two case study questions. So as you can see here, they could afford to pay 372 million, which is a 7.4 X multiple. And the IRR at this price is 35.7%. So that's a very simple example of how to use LBO valuation. Now this tends to be more useful when you also combine it with sensitivity tables. So let's just fill these in quickly. With both of these, we're looking at purchase multiples and exit multiples. Since we have multiples in this range of roughly 7 to 8x, it might be reasonable to range this from 6 to 9x, make it a little bit broader than that range that we have right now, but not too broad. We don't want to expand it to 2x to 15x or something that wide. It's probably not going to happen in real life. So we're going to start this at 6x. I'm going to hard code the first number here. Very important. You should not link this to anything in the model. Then we're going to add 0.5 to this number in each of these cells. And they do the same thing for the purchase multiple. Again, I'm hard coding that first number. And then we're going to add 0.5 to that in each row as we go down. Now, for the actual number we're calculating, we'll link to the cash on cash multiple. I'll anchor that with F4 up here. And then for the other table, we're going to be calculating the IRR. So I'll link to that. And I can actually just link to all these numbers because they're not a part of our IRR or cash on cash multiple calculations. They're just for display purposes in our tables down here. So I'm just including simple links to these. And then let's select this whole area. You could press Alt DT or you could press Alt A W T in newer versions of Excel. For the row input cell, we want the exit multiple L7 and for the column input cell we want the purchase multiple F7 down here. We can see that as our exit multiple goes up our cash and cash multiple goes up which is what you'd expect and as the purchase multiple goes up our cash and cash multiple goes down which is also what you'd expect. So let's go down and actually fill that out for this next table. Remember we used L7 and F7 and we can do the same thing down here. So L7 and then F7, and we have this. 
These sensitivity tables help us because now we can answer some of these other questions more easily. You can also see that even for questions numbers one and two, I've included these tables down here just to give some greater context around our answers. So let's move on now. Now question number three, by how much would the EBITDA margin need to increase in each year to achieve a 3x cash on cash multiple if you assume the same purchase price? So if we keep our purchase multiple at 7.4x and the purchase price at 372 million euros, what would the EBITDA margin have to be for our returns multiple to be 3x? This is a good example of what I was referring to earlier on in the PowerPoint slides that you can set multiple conditions and say that for a given purchase price, the margins have to be a certain level for a certain IRR or for a certain returns multiple. So let's go down and use goal seek once again, and I'll set the cash and cash multiple alt A W G to go to goal seek. I will set this to three and then we're going to change cell L18 up here, the EBITDA margin cell. You can see exactly where it is. So let's select that and then I'll press OK. And we have a solution. Our EBITDA margin has to be 27.8%. You can see our EBITDA down here is higher. And then if you go down to the actual math, you can see how this comes out to a 3x multiple and a 44.2% IRR. And all the math is laid out right here. So those are the types of questions we can answer with an LBO valuation and with goal seek. I've filled this in right here and just given some more text to explain the answer. One thing I am pointing out is that we are assuming the LTM EBITDA stays the same. So if you think about it, it would be very confusing if, for example, we went into Excel and we said, let's change the year zero EBITDA and make that margin different as well. It wouldn't really make sense because then we'd sort of end up in an infinite loop where we keep changing the baseline numbers that we buy the company based on. And then we also change what it looks like in the future. So we just want to be careful to avoid something like that. Let's move on. So if the EBITDA exit multiple were 1x higher, how would that impact the purchase price required to achieve a 2.5x cash on cash multiple over three years? So here we're back to our original scenario of pointing to a 2.5x multiple. I'm going to change back the EBITDA purchase multiple for now and also change back our EBITDA margin to 25%. So we've reset everything to its beginning state. And then the question is, what happens if we change the exit multiple to 9x? To answer this, we could look in these sensitivity tables, but we could also just go up and change the exit multiple to 9x. And now our cash and cash multiple is 2.5x. So to answer this question, we could just go in and say that the purchase multiple has to be 8x, or if we want to be more precise, we could use goal seek again, alt A W G, set cell F89 to value 2.5. And we do that by changing the purchase multiple up here. And we can see it just comes out to 8x once again. So not terribly insightful, but that is what we can say for this answer. Now, we're also saying here that according to our sensitivity tables, we have some additional insight that for each 0.5x increase in the exit multiple, the cash on cash multiple goes up by around 0.2 to 0.3, sometimes up to 0.4x. And then the IRR goes up by around, looks like 4 to 5%, maybe 3 to 4 to 5%, something in that range. So those are some additional conclusions that we can draw from these types of tables. And then this very simple question next, what are the IRR and multiple if we pay 7x and we exit for 8x after three years? So this one is fairly simple. We just change it to seven and then we change the exit multiple to 8x. We have both of those and let's go down and we can see our cash and cash multiple of 2.9x and our IRR of 42.9%. So, I've just included the actual calculations and shown the Excel paste in right there. And then finally, the last part here, what are the IRR and cash on cash multiples if the PE firm exits via an IPO in three years, but sells only 60% of its stake? 
the senior debt will stay in place and the purchase multiple and exit multiple will be the same, 7x and 8x. And then we're also assuming that the PE firm's remaining stake is sold one year after the IPO and that the share price increases by 30% in that year. So we have a couple things going on. To answer this question, let's go back first. And since they're only selling 60% of their stake in year three, let's change this and make it 60%. Instead, I'm multiplying this by 60%, the equity value. So the investor equity here is 60% of the exit equity value. And then in year four, we're going to link to the equity value as well. And I'm going to multiply by 40%. And I will multiply by 1.3 to represent the fact that the share price has increased by 30%. So we have that. I'm just going to change the formatting. Now you might think we're done, but there's one other thing that we forgot, which is that the senior debt has to stay in place. Often this happens in an IPO because the company will not necessarily repay all of its debt right away when it goes public. And that's what we are assuming here. And often it's not even going to be the private equity firm's responsibility to do that. In this case, sometimes I would emphasize. So we need to change this formula for the exit equity value. And instead of subtracting the entire debt balance, we want to subtract only the second lien debt and the paid in kind loan and we still wanna add our cash balance at the end. So now this comes out to a cash on cash multiple of 3.8X and an IRR of 47.6%. And you can see how the proceeds come back to the PE firm over years three and four. So we've pasted in our answer to this below and just shown the full calculation as well. But that's really all there is to this case study and how you answer these types of questions about LBO valuation. Really, the main point of this entire exercise, in my opinion, is that you have to get this set up the right way to begin with. If you don't have the right setup, and especially if you waste time or you don't get the assumptions in the beginning right, all the rest of this is not going to work. What we just covered here is fairly simple, and it's just a straightforward application of the goal seek function, but you need the right foundation for that to work. In short, with this type of case study, proceed quickly simplify the assumptions where it makes sense to do so, go and fill in the financial statements, save your interest expense and debt tracking calculations to the end, calculate investor returns, only bother with something like this if you need to do so. We need to do so here because of the IPO scenario, but if you don't have that, just make it simple and just look at the exit in one year, divide by the initial investor equity and use that to get some of these numbers. And then if they ask you to, yes, make the sensitivities. For LBO valuation, make sure you know how to use the goal seek function. Make sure that you have everything reduced appropriately and that circular references are disabled. So that's it for our coverage of this particular case study. I hope you got something out of it and learned what to expect for these types of in-office, in-person modeling tests, whether they are given on the job at assessment centers or even when you go in for investment banking or private equity interviews.